So now I'm excited to talk to you about the third edition of the Strengthening Hospital Responses to Family Violence Toolkit and Service Model. Should we have a drum roll? Da, da, da. <laughs> um, so I do want to begin by saying that the third edition is an, an improved, enhanced edition to previous ones. So in 2014, Benigo Health and the Women's developed this model and it was really informed by international best practice. Um, we particularly looked at Kaiser Permanente, which is a large health service provider in Northern California. We looked at the clinical guidelines that Kelsey worked on from the World Health Organization in terms of responding to intimate partner violence. And more recently, we've actually been informed by the WITH study, which was funded by Anne Rose in the past 12 months. So I do want to acknowledge that as well. Over the last 12 months, we've had 16 hospitals implementing this work. And so I do want to acknowledge all of them because they have also contributed and informed the third edition of the toolkit that we're, or the model and toolkit that we're launching today. So what's different about the third edition of the toolkit? Well, the main difference is the project scope changed in the past 12 months. So for the first two stages of the project, we were very much focused on responding to intimate partner violence. But of course, as more hospitals came on board with different demographics and different settings compared to a women's hospital, it was really clear that we needed to look at family violence across the lifespan. So I do want to start by acknowledging that um, the superstars of a couple of services that really helped us with this work, and we're all pretty happy that it's published today because it's been a busy couple of weeks getting here. Megan O'Brien from St Vincent's, Danny Gold from the Royal Children's, Sophie Rapp from Casa Forum. Is Sophie here? Yep. Sophie, yep, who worked on the Responding to Sexual Assault module, and our partners at Bendigo Health who've done a lot of work about responding in a rural regional context. So I think that's one of the key messages for you to know, that regardless of your health service, the model is now um, in a better place for you to adapt as you need to suit your local setting. So I think we've got about 10 minutes till morning tea. So I thought I would do 10 things you need to know about the model in 10 minutes. Okay. Number 10. It's change management. It takes time. It's complex. It's not the job of one person. Our experience at Bendigo Health and the Women's is that it really requires a team of committed multidisciplinary professionals from across the health service coming together to grapple with the difficulties and the complexity of this work. It seems that every time you start one piece of work, it opens up another issue and it's just this chain of events. So I think like any change, it's complicated and it takes time. Number nine essential is the support from the top down. So I think we couldn't ask for a better advocate at the Women's than our CEO, Sue Matthews. I wish she was here. I was going to give her a wrap. Um, but also the CEO, the board, the executive, the senior management, if they don't get this from the outset, that is really going to challenge your health service. So for all the executives and CEOs in the room, if this is the only thing you hear today, please listen. <laughs> um, and when we talk about leadership, we talk about I think something that perhaps we didn't do at the women's so well is engaging senior management from the outset. So we've actually developed as part of the toolkit a senior manager's briefing presentation, which we highly recommend um, those health services coming on board, that you deliver that as a priority to make sure you do have that top-down engagement. So number eight um, is, again, something we've really enhanced with the model this year, and it's really based on the learnings of the women's and the other hospitals that have been doing this work over the past 12 months. And that is really, we can't separate our workforce, workforce from this work, and actually we do need to be looking to them first and the support and structures we have in place for them. So not just in terms of their own, um, for our clinicians that are actually working directly with patients, so making sure we've got support in place for them to actually do this complex work, but as we've seen from the um, evidence Kelsey just provided, our own staff have their own personal experiences of family violence. So um, we've really adapted and included into the model, which wasn't in the previous two editions, um, support for the workforce being key. And at the Women's, we launched our own family violence workplace support program in November last year. And we've shared a lot of our tools and thinking and work into the toolkit. And over the next 12 months, we'll be actually coming around. We're funded to come around and support you to develop your own program if you don't have that support in place. And again, that links back to the Enrose uh, with study because that was really about the staff-centred care. So we've really, really captured... We've got patient-centred care and staff-centred care as the two really key um, components of the Strengthening Hospitals model. 
So sensitive practice, you've heard mentioned a couple of times today, and sensitive practice is what we're training our clinicians to do. So there was a question before about do we train all staff at the hospitals? Absolutely we do. So there's two key modules as part of the Strengthening Hospital Toolkit. Module one is for all hospital staff, and that goes into um, understanding family violence and its drivers. Module two is actually how to identify and respond to family violence, and this is where we train our clinicians in sensitive practice. And there's six, uh, six steps in that. And this afternoon, we're actually going to take you through role playing and show you that in action. Um, that has also been informed by international, international um, best practice, particularly some work out of Health Canada in um, responding to child sexual abuse victims. And sensitive practice is really about trauma-informed care. And it's about training our staff how to ask patients about their experiences and then respectfully responding and referring as appropriate. So you'll hear more about that today. So I think we've already heard why hospitals are important in this work. A really important principle of the Strengthening Hospitals model is that we need to take a leadership role in our communities. Um, we need to make a stand, really, and we need to do what we can to promote gender equity, respectful relationships, and a zero tolerance to violence. <laughs> And as part of the toolkit, we have um, also ad the new and improved toolkit. We've added in some um, new posters that you can brand um, for your own hospital that will really show your hospital's commitment to this. And we highly encourage you to display them proudly in your hospital. Uh, the photo here, it's something else you might want to think about. So we, whenever there's an awareness raising activity, we're trying to get involved at the women's. And this is a photo from the Clothesline Project, which maybe some of you have heard about. Um, it was a really great opportunity. October last year, we uh, got a, st a bunch of staff into a room. We painted um, messages on T-shirts and singlets. We actually delivered Strengthening Hospitals training at the same time, so you've got to jump at any opportunity to deliver training. And we had these displayed in our main foyer at the Women's Hospital for several weeks. So, again, it's just showing our commitment um, and zero tolerance for violence. So, where to begin? This is a really good question. Where do you begin? Well... What we would recommend, and this is again going to our experience at the women's, is that you select clinical areas where you're likely to see more patients at risk of family violence. So that would include your emergency department, mental health services, drug and alcohol services, maternity services. The model is designed to really go into a clinical area and look at the policies, procedures, structures in place for that clinical area. And if we were to do that across every clinical area in all of our hospitals, it would take us a decade to get around to all the clinical areas. So that's why we suggest really targeting one or two key areas as a start. For example, the women's focused on our emergency department for the first year, and then we moved into our maternity services in the second year of doing this work. So I think that's a really critical um, thing to mention. The way we're supporting that, so obviously we don't we just rely on our emergency department and our maternity services to do this work. We're also implementing a network of what we're calling at the Women's Prevention of Violence Against Women Clinical Champions. Other hospitals call them clinical leads or change agents. And we're really trying to make sure across the hospital we've got coverage of skilled and trained staff who can support other colleagues in their department and area to do this work. Another uh, key aspect of the Strengthening Hospitals model is building partnerships. We're not in this alone as hospitals. We are really lucky to have local agencies doing amazing work with victim survivors. And one of the uh, key steps of, for your hospital was we'll be mapping out the referral pathways for your patients. So that requires you to do some service mapping, look at the services in your area. And as a really good place to start, we'd suggest um, going through Domestic Violence Victoria and the Family Violence Regional Integration uh, Coordinators. Um, other partnerships that we think are really key are health justice partnerships. So we're really proud at the women's of our health justice partnership within a Melbourne community legal where we've got a free lawyer on site that we can refer our patients to. So if you don't have one, I'd encourage you to look, look to your local um, community, legal community service. And also women's health organisations, PCPs. You know, there's a really core group of agencies and organisations that can support you to do this work. And it's about hospitals working in collaboration. It's not about us doing this alone. And on that point, I think I'd like to say we're not expecting our clinicians to become family violence experts. That is not what we're training them to do. What we are training them to do is to have the confidence and the skills to identify, respond and refer. 
And then it's our role as health services to collaborate with the experts to make sure that women get the response they need. Um, you would have been hiding in a corner if you didn't notice there's a lot of family violence uh, reform going on. And this is absolutely going to impact the strengthening hospitals work over the next 12 months. So a couple of, uh, to mention in particular is the CRAF redevelopment which is underway. The current um, training content for strengthening hospital does align with all the CRAF, the current CRAF, but of course as the CRAF is redeveloped, the Women's and Bendigo Health will review all of our materials and make sure that we align um, what our tra we're training our clinicians in. Same with the information sharing, which Kelsey already mentioned. So how we document and share information about patients is um, changing, so we all have to stay across that. And introduction of support and safety hubs and what that's going to mean in terms of uh, changing referral pathways for patients as well. So there are no clear answers at the moment, but just rest assured, um, the Women's Bendigo will, you know, stay on top of this. Um, there's lots of opportunity for hospitals to be consulted and I would encourage you when that opportunity comes your way to make sure your hospital's got a voice. Um, and it's really great, I think, that we now have greater visibility um, in all of the reform work that's underway. Da, 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 da. Number two, the toolkit is now live. So the third edition of the toolkit, I think we finished uploading it to our website at about seven o'clock last night. <laughs> We're all really happy about that. Um, and this shot just shows you the women's homepage with a nice red circle around where you'll find the third edition of the toolkit. So I've already alluded to some of the um, inclusions in the toolkit this year, but really it is a how-to guide for your hospital. There is no point any of you going on to duplicate the work that has already been done. So you'll be, I hope, impressed, I hope, with the variety of tools that are available to you. So we've got a project management guide, which is just the absolute core document for any project officers or project managers that are appointed to lead this work. We've got a training manual, which is for facilitators of training with copious notes and information about how to run successful training, the Strictly Hospitals training. And then we've got a suite of training modules, so PowerPoint presentations that are ready for you to use, to adapt, to add in your branding, to add in your local um, referral pathways and networks and details. So they're all sitting there ready for you to use and they're supported by, I think, about 30 tools. Is it, Susan? You'd know. Yeah. Um, that'll be really valuable to you. So on this point, I do actually want to do a bit of acknowledgement. Um, it has been a real team effort over the last few months and I would actually like Megan and Danny to stand up, Sophie to stand up, Sharon from Bendigo. Come on. I've, I've got school principal blood in me. I'm, I'm acting like the school principal now. And Susan McKenzie, who has been absolutely critical in coordinating all of this work. It's significant. And I think they all deserve a big round of applause. Um, I really think your work is going to impact not just the people in this room, but hospitals across the state and ultimately improve the lives of many so well done to all of you. I know it hasn't been easy at times, <laughs> but we got there. We got there. So it's really exciting. Um, I've just shown you, this is the website. So we've got a specific Strengthening Hospitals website that you'll be taken through once you click through from the women's homepage. And I did mention we've got a suite of posters. So another really key piece of the, this work is that we create a supportive and safe environment for patients so that they're sitting in our waiting rooms they might see these posters on display and realise it is a safe place for them and that our staff are trained. We, do, we absolutely say do not put these posters up until you've trained staff in that particular clinical area because it would be worse to be plastering these posters everywhere where you don't have skilled, tra uh, skilled staff who can actually um, respond. The other one with the birds on it is uh, posters for staff-facing areas just to remind them to do the sensitive inquiry and sensitive practice. And again, you can add your own hospital's logo and branding to these. There's about 15 different posters with different messages that you can um, download and use. Pretty good, hey? Yeah. So finally, how am I going for time? All right. Um, I started off by saying, number 10, that this is complex, hard work, and it is. So what we have definitely learned at the Women's is that we need to celebrate our achievements along the way. I cannot tell you, two years ago, if you asked me, would you get excited, Michelle, when you got a documentation 
a form approved. I would be like, what are you talking about? But actually, the day we got our family violence identification form approved, our team did a party in the office. <laughs> kind of like this. <laughs> so I just, as I alluded to, there's so many challenges and complexities along the way. We have to do our little happy dance and celebrate the success and know that it's hard work, but what an awesome impact we're going to have. So I think that's it. Am I on time? Should I stop that now? Thanks, Michelle, and everyone for all the hard work and engaging in the training. Um, I was involved at the beginning um, from the department's um, side in Victorian government, um, proposing by building on what the um, women's was working on at the time and the, a lot of work around the state as well. Um, just in the context of the uh, slide number three of the ten, I think that it mentioned um, the practice sort of context and the CRAF. Um, so the CRAF is the Common Risk Assessment Framework mm -hmm. on Family Violence and it is the statewide um, framework for family violence as, a, as I understand it and I'm sure you'll get further reference to that in the tools. And um, just as a little bit of background, uh, sorry this is more of a comment than a question, um, we used the term family violence originally drawing on the Family Violence Protection Act and so it does include family relationships and family-like relationships. So that can include um, community type relationships and friendships where there's kind of a dependence. But the project was going in stages, so that may not all be, um, you know, to that level yet. But, um, yeah, just a bit of contextual information. Thank you. Thank you, Penny. And Penny was there way back at the start. So Penny was, you know, from many, many years ago, also played a role in the Strengthening Hospitals project being here today. You'll be very happy to know it's now morning tea time. Please enjoy. Coffee, tea, morning tea. There's a beautiful veranda outside if you want some fresh air. Thank you. Thank you.